Well, good morning, National Hills. How are we? We're few, but we're proud. Awesome. I'm glad to have you guys. If you're at home on Facebook Live, we're really glad you're here. Um, you're with us in spirit. Next week is a big week, and we cannot wait to get back inside. So if you are able to, we'd love to have you. Um, and we'll... Uh, We'll have some communication about that later on. But right now, we're going to worship. Um, so uh, let's just sing these songs out from our hearts this morning to our great God and Savior. Let's pray before we get started. Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful for all you've done and all you're doing. God, even though the world just seems like it's in a, in a chaotic mess right now, Father, we know that you're on your throne, that you're that you're the sure thing, that, God, you're the one that we can put our hope and our trust in. And, Jesus, we know that you never fail. We know that all, all throughout history and all throughout your word, you have never failed. You've always been the one to be found right. And so, Jesus, we love you. We trust you. We sing to you this morning with our hearts. And, God, we, uh, we just proclaim you as the King of kings. Lord, we love you. When we ask all this in your name, just be with us this morning. Amen. Praise the Son, 
to be together this morning to be able to celebrate all that God is doing. And we got a couple other things we want to celebrate this morning. So socially distanced, but by a round of just beeps and honks and hoops and hollers, today is Mr. Andrew's birthday. And then, and then tomorrow, since we're not going to be together, we want to give a special shout out to somebody else's birthday. Pastor Kevin, what's tomorrow? God's his birthday. 49 years young. Look at that guy. We love you guys so much. Happy birthday. We are so blessed to be able to celebrate with you guys. We're also so blessed to be able to be here to worship the King of Kings this morning. National Hills, we believe that we want to connect people to Christ, to community, and to the world. And we get to do that by hearing his word, by worshiping together and to be able to celebrate. And you know, no matter what the world throws at us, no matter what Satan throws our way, we will never give up the fact that Jesus is King. So today, this morning, as we worship, as we gather together in our cars or at home or wherever you may be, remember that you're not in this alone, that God is sufficient, that he loves you more than anything, and that he sent his son to die for you. And we get to celebrate that this morning. So let's continue to worship one, with one another and let's celebrate all that he is. Amen. We've seen what you can do, oh God of wonders. Your power has no end. Things you've done before in great measure, you will do again. No prison, there's no prison wall you can't break through. No mountain you can't move. All things are possible. There's no broken body you can't raise. No. So that you can save all things are possible. The darkest night, you can light it up. You can light it up. Oh God, a green revival. Let hope arise. Death is overcome. You've already. You can light it up. You can light it up. 
the city for revival for him. Come awaken the people, come awaken the city. so grateful that you're the one you're the one who we look to you're the one who we can trust who we can fall on and count on but God when we say there's no there's no broken body that you can't raise God you prove that time and time again through your word there's no wall you can't break through God you you do that daily and Jesus, we, we trust you. We love you. God, I pray right now that you would speak to our hearts. That God, you would you would move Kevin out of the way, Jesus. That you would bring your word, God. That you would speak to us, God. That we would hear from you. That we would be attentive to your word. Oh God, we love you. We're so thankful for all you've done and all you're doing. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you, Brian, and it is great being back with you here today. Uh, what a what a delight it is. Uh, I'm grateful for all the hard work our tech team has put into uh, setting all of this up, volunteers to help park and uh, others helping uh, Brian in putting so many things together. Thank you for being here. Uh, again, we are glad that uh, we get to gather uh, in person in this way and in this augmented fashion. In the next week, as you know, our uh, Lord willing, unless things change, we are intending to be back in our building for the first time in four months. So that will be a delight, and uh, we're grateful for a place. Uh, we know that God does not inhabit locations. He inhabits us. We are His temple. But we're grateful for a place that we can worship and gather together. We are going to be taking precautions, as you know. Those will be sent to you in email form and by social media. Uh, we're wanting to be wise, uh, but but also uh, try to get together in compliance with all of the, the things we are needing to do. Uh, we are glad to be back also from vacation. We are grateful for a church that understands the need uh, to allow its staff to get away, to get a breather, to get their minds 
right with the Lord, to spend time with the Lord, to let their bodies rest, to have some concentrated time with family. So thank you for the opportunity uh, to be away, and it is really good to be back with you uh, here today. Another thing, of whatever age they might be, two years old or 20 years old, whenever you instruct your child of a certain age to do something, it's not uncommon to, right? Have you ever had that experience before where, where you know, you, especially with the younger ones, you, you're telling them, hey, listen, go take your plate for why? You know, and I want you to uh, go wash your hands. Why? <laughs> Don't run in the street. Why? Get that question. Why? And and it's it's. In fact, I was speaking with uh, with some friends yesterday. Uh, we were talking about some children are naturally bent, just in the way that God made them, in the way He formed and fashioned their brains and their heart and their makeup. Uh, that they were made to kind of ask why. It's not a matter of rebellion necessary or uh, necessarily or a matter of, of unwillingness to conform, just that they were wired to understand the reasoning behind something. Let me understand why and, and I'll do it. Well, God knew that we were wired that way and Paul knew that it was important for us to understand when we were given the commands to obey Christ, why we were given these commands. God doesn't accept and doesn't expect blind obedience, although he perfectly deserves it. He can tell us what to do, and we should just do it simply because he is God, and he is authoritative in every area of our lives, but he doesn't do that. God gives us the reasons why it's not only logical, but helpful to obey his word. Now, in the book of Philippians, in chapter uh, 2, we've been looking in this series for a number of weeks now. Uh, entitled Obey. Now we took a little three-week hiatus off there to talk about the value of the body of Christ, why it's important for us as believers to value one another and value being together. Uh, but before that, we were in Philippians chapter 2, and we were discussing this idea of obedience. Paul says in verse 12 that whether I'm with you or whether I'm away, I want you to obey or to continue to obey. And he tells us that even in our obedience, it's God who's ultimately doing the work to make us like Christ. It's him who both works and wills for his good pleasure. Now, as we are obeying, the progression of thought continues in Paul's writing. In verse 14, as we are to obey, we are to do those things without grumbling or without complaining. So don't, don't do the right thing and have a complaining spirit about it, right? It's one thing to obey, but to have the right attitude and the right spirit is of great importance. That's a part of obedience. In fact, we're instructed by way of command, do all things without grumbling and without arguing. And then he gives us the reasons that we are to obey in this fashion or with this attitude. So we talked about the command of obedience in verse 12, uh, and we talked about uh, in, verse, uh, in verse 14 the attitude of obedience, and now we're going to talk about the purpose or the goal of obedience. Why should we obey? What's the aim that we're shooting for? You know, a lot of times in life, we, we forget what we're trying to do. We forget that there's a specific purpose in mind in what we're doing. Sometimes when you're on the job site, you're getting a job, you're, you're working, and, and you're in the middle of all the throes of the details. I mean, you're just getting all the details taken care of, and sometimes you forget the bigger purpose or picture of what your job is, what what's the end goal of it? You can lose sight of the of the forest for for the particular trees. Paul wants us to to keep our eyes on the main goal of obedience. What is it God's trying to do through our our, our obedience? Is it merely that we're just to do what He says for no purpose whatsoever, just because He said it? Because I said so. Worst lines of parents ever, right? I confess. I've used them. Honk if, if you've ever used that. Because I said so. Yeah. Right. That's, that's when we as parents get lazy and we don't want to explain the rationale for why. Or we don't even know the rationale. So we just say, you know, because I said so. But God wants us to keep in mind the aim or the goal of obedience. In most sports, there is something called a goal. Right? In football, uh, when someone passes and makes a, a touchdown or runs in and, and scores, they, they score a goal. And then when they kick it through, if they end up doing that, they, they kick it through and make a field goal, right? Or, or, or I guess the extra point there, or they kick it from the 20-yard line forever else, a field goal. In soccer, 
there's a goal. I always wanted to be one of those guys. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I love being in ministry. I'm glad God has me in ministry. I don't have any regrets that he called me into ministry and this has been my life. And, but I, I got to, I gotta, you know, when things get hard, I'm just going to be honest with you. When things get hard, sometimes you think about other things you could do. It's not godly. It's not the right thing. God always brings you around. But you think about other things you could do. Like, for instance, I've always kind of wanted to be a commentator. Uh, a commentator. Like someone on sports. I've always wanted to be one of those guys that when, when you know, especially, like, I could go to South America. And when someone scores, I could go, go! You know, just make utterances, and you get paid for that. That's amazing. But, but, but we, but what are they saying? They're saying someone has worked cooperatively together as a team, and and they shot the ball in, and they scored. They had an end in mind. They had a goal that they were aiming for. Whether it's soccer or football or hockey or any or basketball, any other sport, they are obviously and always seeking to keep the, the end game in mind. What is the goal? So we're going to talk about three goals. These aren't going to be too long, but Philippians chapter 2, verse 15 and verse 16, they give us three goals for our obedience. Three things we're aiming for when we obey, or that God desires for us to aim for in our obedience. The first goal of our obedience is blamelessness blamelessness. That's what he says in verse, so, so look how he ties the words together. Verse 14, do all things, well what are the all things, the, the all things of obedience in verse 12 that he's speaking of. All these things that we've talked about, how God's working in you, your holiness, he's working out his will in your life. Um, do all those things without grumbling and disputing, without arguing about it, just obey. And here he gives us the reason, the word Verse In verse 15, the word that begins the sentence, that is a purpose clause. In the original language, it's intended to say, here's the reason, here's the intended outcome or goal of your obedience. So, that you may become, or that you may be blameless. Blamelessness is the first goal of our obedience. Verse 12 He's urging us to live out our salvation, to work out our salvation in, in a way that, that shows obedience. But why? So that you might become blameless. Now, notice that the word be is not merely, and you may not see this in the English translation, but it can also be rendered that you might become, that you might presently be and continue to be and ultimately become blameless. See, it's not, being blameless is not an instantaneous thing. When you came to faith in Jesus Christ, God in His mercy gave you His righteousness. He took all of your filthy rags, He took all of your sin, all of your regrets, all the junk in your life that you don't, you wish you didn't have. He took all of that and He took it and He nailed it to the cross so that there is no handwriting of offense against you, the book of Colossians says. Praise His name. He washed all of that away and he gave you his righteousness. That's what the word justification means. It means he, he made you to be like Christ. He removed the offense out of the way, and he gave you his righteousness. So when God looks at you now, he presently sees you in the state or in the condition of being righteous. But that doesn't mean that always works itself out practically in our lives. All right, do you track with what I'm saying? Practically, in our lives, sometimes there is not righteousness. Sometimes in our lives, there's a lack of holiness. The way we speak, the way that we act, the attitudes that we take, they don't resemble Christ so much. And so he says blamelessness is one of those goals of obedience. It's a process of becoming like him. Notice in verse uh, 13, is God that's working in us. So there's this cooperative effort between our effort and obedience and his work in us. But we are becoming blameless. Now the word blameless means without accusation. The idea is that if someone were to throw an accusation against you, it would not be plausible or believable. Our first year of marriage, we went on vacation up to Tennessee and Pigeon Forge and in that area there, a tourist mecca. And they had this, they, they had, you know, Tennessee, in Pigeon Forge, it's an interesting place, isn't it? 
It, it is the most bizarre place of entertainment, of various kinds of entertainment. You can get a whole strip. I mean, for miles and miles of, of go-karts and taffy, or, uh, and taffy candy uh, stores and, and putt-putt and all kinds of miniature, all kinds of different things. But in particular, they had, a, they had at, at this time, a, a blow-up inflatable wall that was full of Velcro. Now, can you imagine the massive amount of Velcro on this blow-up inflatable? Think of uh, an inflatable slide, like an inflatable water slide, but instead of the, there being the stairs, there was just a wall filled with Velcro, right? And then people who would pay money for this, good money for this, right? They, they would dress up in this jumpsuit. It looked like something, at, like a prisoner, just, just like, like, a, like someone just escaped. And that was full of the opposite part of the Velcro. And the idea was you jumped and you bounced on this bouncy house-like thing for adults and you th bounce and throw yourself against the Velcro wall. Well, I don't know what was in me, but I decided that this would be a great idea. This would be something that I would, why wouldn't anyone want to do this, right? Bounce on an adult bouncy thing and throw yourself against the wall. So I, I took my 21-year-old self and and put that suit on in the blazing heat of the Tennessee summer and begin to bounce and throw myself against the bouncy. Only the only thing it was, I never could stick. I mean, I, I, I just bounced, I just, with all of my weight, with all of my physical effort, with all of my strength, I, I bounced and I ran and I threw myself against the wall only to be bounced backwards and, and rejected and, and fall and somersault backwards until the end. I, I wouldn't stop. Until the guy, the guy had to finally just say, "That's it. okay. You, your turn's over, sir. There are other people who need to to get perfectly good money for this wasteless event." So I mean, I mean, that was that was the sort of situation. I I threw myself against it, but it, but I wouldn't stick. That's the idea of of this word blameless. It's not talking about perfection, believer. You, you're not going to be perfect in this life. But we're talking about if someone were to level an accusation against you, it wouldn't stick. Someone would say, that man lacks serious integrity. That that lady, she's a gossip. You might have sinned now and then, but but you know, that's not true or typical of your life. It's not that it's not that you've never sinned and someone couldn't point out an individual sin. But the point is that this isn't true or typical of your character. It, you are you are blameless in that regard. Not just blameless because uh, God is doing the work in you and will one day make you and present you blameless, but that your actual life here on earth is like that. The idea is that the world, when it's looking at us, says there's something different about this person, that you may become blameless. When God looked at Abraham's life in the book of Genesis in chapter 17, it says that Abraham walked blamelessly before him. Now, Abraham wasn't perfect. In fact, the Bible is... No, uh, it holds no secret regarding Abraham's life. There were some serious offenses that he had. But the point is that after sinning, he repented and came back and that the bulk of his life, the, char the characterization of his life, the trajectory of his life was toward blamelessness, not toward deceit. So we're to be blameless. When we, when we get to Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 5, we see that the Israelites are being judged um, as Moses sings this song. And in the middle of this song that Moses is singing towards the end of his life, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 5, he mentions these words as an exact quote. He says, children of God, but you were not blameless. You, you didn't look like children of God. You, you rebelled against him. Paul uses this exact quote in the, these words to talk to the, those who are now children of God. He says, I want you to be so obedient that people cannot hurl an accusation against you and it stick. Blameless children. And then he mentions here, or, or I should say, uh, blame, blameless. And then, and then secondly, not only should, should our goal be blamelessness, but the second goal should be innocence. So blamelessness as the first goal, innocence as the second goal of our obedience. So look again what he says in verse uh, 15. That you may be blameless and innocent. Now, this idea of innocence has to do with purity. You're, you're not living a hypocritical life. It has to do with not to do with purity. Now, hearkening back to 
Daniel was, a, was an Israelite who was deported to Babylon, and he was a sharp man, a good-looking man, in fact, as the book of Daniel reports. And he was trained. He ended up getting into leadership quite quickly with that eastern kingdom and rising to be an assistant to the king. Well, those who were around him were, were really jealous. They, they didn't like the fact that they were being passed over for high levels of leadership in the government, and they wanted that for themselves. So they began to look at Daniel's life to see if they might find some accusation against him in order to accuse him to the king. Well, they began examining him and watching his patterns, his course of life. You know, many in leadership at that time, especially those with access to the national treasury, as Daniel would have had, and other national resources, would have used those for their own benefit, for their own personal good. Daniel could not be accused in that way. Many might have skimmed off something for themselves, or perhaps spoken evil against the leadership in front of them, compromised their integrity in some way. But at the end of the day, after observing Daniel in his life, the only accusation that they could bring against him that would stick was that he was fully devoted and dedicated to God. And that's their tact. Uh, uh, that's their, that was their tact of accusation against him. Finally, they said, let's make an ordinance where no one can pray to anyone but the king. And, and Daniel continued to pray. That's the idea of blamelessness is that it's not that he was perfect. We know that there's none righteous, no, not one. We know that we're all in need of redemption and forgiveness. But the, but the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins comes from Christ and he can make us blameless before him. But now we, he uses this word innocence, that you might become blameless and that you might become innocent. This word was used of metals. When uh, they were making money back in ancient times, some 2,000 years ago, uh, silver was often and commonly used as a choice metal for, uh, for exchange of value. But, but sometimes people would come in and in an effort to use less silver and keep more and accumulate more and skim off, they, they would pour in another metal to that silver and they would, they would allo it, it would be alloyed, that it would be a joined metal together and it would compromise the value. Or when making tools um, or, or, or weapons, they would use a softer metal that was cheaper or, and, or more accessible and they would use that rather than the full strength of the metal that was desired for that tool or for that weapon and it would become alloy well this word here is the opposite of that word unmixed with impurity or unmixed or undiluted in fact it was used of wine in that day when uh, people would want to maybe sell a cheaper version and they didn't want to get the full concentrate they would mix it with water and therefore dilute the wine well the idea is for believers, we are to be unmixed with sin. We're, we're not to continue in our in our sinful state. We're, we're not to say, well, I'm a believer. I'm going to live, uh, you know, uh, as best as I can. But as long as there's some sins in me, I'm okay with those things. I'm going to live a, a life of holiness in this area, but a life mixed with sin in that area. And, you know, it's all okay. The idea is, no, no, no. You're not to be polluted with or contaminated with any of it. You're not to be diluted with any amount of sin. As believers, we should live an unadulterated life. Listen, that's a high standard, no doubt. But it is accessible and achievable through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, it's Him who's doing His will in you, both to do and to accomplish His good pleasure. In fact, in Jude chapter 24, we read this encouraging word. Now to Him, talking about God, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time now and forevermore amen what, what is he saying he's saying one day all of us are going to stand before a perfect and a holy God and none of us can do that on our own all of us will melt in the presence of a perfect God we just can't stand in his presence. Remember Isaiah, when he was in the presence of God in chapter 6, he, he had to fall to his face and he said, oh wretched man that I am. And he, he said, I, I'm, a, I'm an unclean man. I dwell among a, a people of un, who are unclean. Our lips are unclean. We're impure. And an angel flew over with a with a tongue that received a coal from, from the altar and, and came over and cleansed him. The idea is that in, um, in the presence of a perfect and a holy God, we cannot stand. But God is doing this work in you. 
and any desire or inclination toward obedience and holiness in your life is God working out his obedience through you. And one day, if you're a believer in Christ, he's going to present you blameless, faultless before his throne, pure before him. And that's why Jude, when he writes, says, to this only God and Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time. If you're here this morning, Scripture says, we're going to give an account before throne, even believers of our life, of the things done in our bodies, whether good or bad. We're going to give an account before him. But God is working the process of obedience. If you're uncomfortable with your sin, we should be very uncomfortable living with a mixture of holiness and a mixture of sin in our lives. Consistencies. And the fact that you are uncomfortable is evidence of the Holy Spirit working in your life, convicting you, and making you uh, uh, fit for his kingdom, and making you ready for holiness. This morning, about 4 o'clock, I, uh, I woke up with a throbbing pain in my finger. It's, it's amazing how the smallest digit on, on, in your body can provide enough pain to wake you up. I don't know, I did something working around the house yesterday um, on, on my fingertip there in a small little cut, and the pain and the throbbing, the pulsing, I could feel my blood pressure in my finger as it swelled up with blood, right? That, that something had gotten in there and that pain was a gift of me, a gift to me. I woke up and I something's wrong. This pain is indicating something is not like it should be. There's some foreign matter has gotten, has begun an infection and I need to do something about that. When you feel convicted about your sin, when you feel uncomfortable about your state of your Christian life, when you, when you are constantly, when you're dealing with this inner angst, you don't like the attitudes that you seem to take so quickly. You don't like the manifestations of the way that sin works its way out in the way that you talk. You don't like the sin that you are actively engaged in with your life or with your body. That, And you feel a pain point? That is a mercy of God because he's using his Holy Spirit to convict you of that and to make you more like Christ. And so he tells us that we are to have innocence as a typifier of our lives, that we might be undiluted with sin, that we might be blameless, and that we might be innocent. Innocent in the way that we speak. Can I be honest with you? I think a lot of times in our world, especially as believers, there's become, there, there's been such a swing from this legalistic, harsh, angry, demanding tone of obedience, like just do it, just be, and, and this rigid sort of living. There's been such a swing now in Christian circles where holiness is a little bit out of vogue, and especially in the way that we speak, so that the words of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, speak really convictingly to us, where he says, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is good for building up, as is fitting for the occasion, that it may impart or give grace to those who hear. In other words, we're to have innocence in our conversation. When we allow corrupt speech to come out of our mouth, when we allow the coarse language that the world has reserved for certain things as a way of kind of in-your-face sort of speech, and we allow that to be part of our, our language, we're allowing corrupt communication. When we allow the, the sorts of conversations that this world prizes as humorous, but we know fly in the face of the perfect character of Christ, when we allow those things to become those things that we engage in, our communication has become corrupt and not pure. It's become adulterated and not innocent. And so we're told in our conversations and in our characters, when no one's looking, that we are to be innocent. So the goal of obedience, what is God doing in you? What is he seeking to create? A blamelessness before his throne? And innocence, and then finally a third goal of obedience for us is resemblance. All right, so say it out loud just so you can, I won't know if you're doing it or not, but say it out loud, blamelessness, innocence, and thirdly, resemblance. Now notice what he says in verse 15, so that you may, come, be, may become blameless and pure or innocent, or pure and innocent in the, the original language. And he says, children of God without blemish. Now that word without blemish is reserved almost exclusively in the Old and New Testament for a lamb that was going to be sacrificed to God. And it was used of Christ when in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 19 it says that we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot or blemish. He says we're to be children 
without blemish. Children of God. Children who look like their father. Because God is holy. And he tells us that we are to be holy as he is holy. So what does he say? He says, check this out. He says, we are to look like our Abba Father. We're to look like, have this family resemblance. A couple days ago, I was uh, scrolling on, on Facebook. I, 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 you know. Not, not to condemn, but you know, you can lose a lot of time if you're not careful. You got to put some guardrails on social media. Can I get a witness to that? He's, he's like just, he's just like rolling around, going, "Oh man, where did the time go?" But I was doing that anyway. I should have been sleeping, but and I, I leaned over and I said, "Marianne, look at this picture. It's a picture of a of a pastor friend of mine in in the area, and he was posed with his family, and I think two people over was his uh, was his I'm presuming 18 year old son or so, and I said. Look at how identical the son looks to the father. I mean, it was uncanny. It was absolutely, it was as though my friend Ron took a picture of himself 25 years ago with his chiseled nose and his thin, lean, tall frame and his, his clear profile and his, his sky-like blue eyes. It was as though 25 years ago he took a picture of himself in cap and gown and photoshopped and superimposed it there in place of his son. He looked exactly like his father, just a little bit younger version of it. I, I, it was so remarkable, I just stopped everything and said, you've got to see this. Like, how does that happen? Well, we know. We know how it happens. It's called genetics, right? And then it's intended to be like that. You, you kind of look like maybe your parents, or maybe you don't exactly. But that's the point entirely of what Paul is trying to say. We have a perfect God, a God who is perfect in his holiness. And he wants us to look like him. Not because he's egotistical or proud or, or, or in some way needs something from us, but rather it's for our own good. What he's doing is he's creating in us his own character. And over the course of your life, he's making you conform more and more to what scripture says is the image of Christ so that we would become blameless children of God. Ephesians chapter 1, 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Because you are children who are greatly loved, beloved children, because you are children who are greatly loved, imitate God. Imitate your Father. He is worthy of imitating. When I was a kid, oftentimes two, uh, sometimes three times a week, growing up in Southern California, we would end up going to the beach. And my dad would always end up taking walks or when he was younger, uh, in his maybe mid thirties, early thirties, he would go for a run or go for a jog. He was in the military and always tried to keep a pretty good physical shape. And he would go for a run. And I remember as a kid wanting to go with him. You know, as a kid, sometimes, as an adult, sometimes you're like, I need a little space. Give me a little space and a little breather. And the beach is a great place for that. But as a kid, you, you want to just be with you. You know, you want to be like your parents. You want to be, you want to be, you want to be in their in their presence, and so my dad would go for a walk or a run. And I remember as a little kid, in the, as he would run at the at the base of the of the sand and, and at the where the where the water meets the the shore, he would run and he would leave these muddy, thick, deep three inch deep uh, footprints. And I would run and I would try to leap in each one of those. Of course, his stride was much greater than mine, and frankly, still is. But I would I would reach every step and try to mimic his step. Because I wanted to be like him. Listen, you get the picture for how it is with us and God. We, we may fall short. We may not. We may not reach the perfect stride of, of God. We may not look exactly like Christ. But but we are reaching. We are doing what Paul says in Philippians four. We are straining towards the prize. We are we are stretching and becoming more and more like Him as God does His work in us. And look at the importance of this issue. He says that you may become blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. Look at this. In this crooked and perverse or twisted world. Listen, I, I'm not going to go off on this world. These words are enough to suffice for themselves. But He uses a word called crooked. A number of years ago, I was having trouble sleeping. And... Um, 
I would wake up at night gasping for air. That's kind of a bad feeling, you know? You ever been underwater and, and maybe a wave tumbled you to the ground or or you, you've been unable to breathe? That's a really bad feeling. I'd wake up gasping for air until finally Marianne said, you know, you got to go to the doctor and do something. I think you got sleep apnea. And indeed, she was right. I went to the doctor and he said, you know, he goes, have you ever broken your nose? I said, well, I, I don't think so. I, I do remember a time when my brother beat me up. I was five. He punched me in the nose so squarely that blood gushed everywhere. I remember that. Maybe he did it, you know. <laughs> I wanted to blame him. But, but at any rate, the doctor said, your nose goes this way. Then it goes back this way. <laughs> then it turns back around, your, your septum back that way. And it goes that way. Your nose is all twisted up. Like, well, no wonder I can't breathe, you know. I got, I'm all jacked up up in here. You know? <laughs> like, it's all broken up. And, and indeed, so... This is the idea. In fact, this word crooked um, is used in ancient literature in the Greek of a, of a river that like a snake runs back and forth, back and forth. That's how the world is described. This world doesn't understand what it means to walk straight toward God. When God gives a, a command, when God gives his word, he, he, he speaks about a straight line of obedience. But the world wants to twist it this way. It wants to twist it that way. It wants to rationalize why this is okay and why that's okay. In other words, it doesn't keep the straight and narrow path. This world is twisted. It's turning. In fact, in Deuteronomy, when where this, again, the same passage is quoted, chapter 32, verse 5, is speaking about the rebellion of, of the children of Israel and how they justified everything that they wanted to do as okay. But he it says it's a, it's, a, it's a crooked and twisted or mangled world. We live in a world that's mangled. Now, here's the deal. This is the remarkable thing. I really hope that you'll get this. And I know that some of the influences around you are, are really hard to kind of throw off and cast out. But if you can, if you will, in this moment, just tune in really, really tightly here. This world is all mangled up. And here's the deal. This world will tell you in all of its mangledness, in all of its twistedness, in all of its brokenness, it'll tell you that's the ideal way. Like imagine coming upon a wreck. Imagine driving down the road here, and as you're driving, you, you, you see these two vehicles head on collide, just smash up, and you drive there, and it is just like one mangled wreck. I mean, it's, it's a horrible scene. All the metal is twisted. And, and you come upon, you get out to offer aid, and someone says, isn't that amazing? That is great. Oh, look at that. That is like, it's like art. It's like, who could do that? I mean, make all those things twist together and, and crumple, and, and all, that's just incredible. Like, look at the, look at the chaos. Isn't it great? But like, you go, no, help them. Let's jump in, let's do, something is messed up here. But that's what this world does. It, it, it makes a mess of things. Those without Christ make a mess of their life. And, and there's this mangled, twisted uh, brokenness. And, and we regard it as beautiful and great. And we relish it. That's, what, that's, how, that's why the Bible calls Satan the father of lies. He can take anything messed up and make it look good. He says, you in this broken and twisted world... As children of God, you are to shine. Look at this. This is so good. This is so good. Look, at, look again. Hang in there with me for just a moment. In, in verse 15, you are to shine. You are meant to shine. Among whom? You're among this broken, twisted, crooked world. You're to shine as lights in this broken world. You're to shine. You're, you're to shine. In fact, that word shine as lights is used in Greek literature, ancient Greek literature. It's used of the sun. Shining brightly. You are a son. Listen, follower of Christ, son or daughter of God, you are to shine as the blazing sun in a darkened world. What would we be in this world without the sun? I mean, it would just be always night. But the sun comes up in the morning, or more accurately, scientifically, we, we, we rotate towards the sun and we, we enjoy all of its benefits of healing and strength and growth and warmth. In fact, we would freeze up in this world. We, we, but we as believers are to shine as lights in a darkened world. You are a burning sun, S-U-N, and maybe S-O-N as well. You are a burning sun in a darkened world. You, Jesus said, are the light of the world. And then he said, look, 
it makes no sense. This is the essence of what Jesus said in Matthew 5. It makes no sense to be a light. You are the light of the world. It makes no sense if you are indeed that light to take that light and hunt, hide it under a basket where people can't see that. No. Someone that has a light, they, they take that light and they shine it all around so that all the world sees. Then he goes on in his logic, Jesus does in this discourse on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, he says, in fact, a city set on a hill can't be hid. Why? Because all, all the lights are on. And on that hill, those lights shine and they point the way home. Listen, believer, you are like a light in this world. It's dark. It's a darkened world. It's a disturbing world. It's quick, quick twisted and crooked and broken. And, and in the middle of all of that, you shine the way home for people. You are living and working among lost people, broken people. Your house, your apartment, the place you stay is located. Scattered all around you are lost, broken, twisted people who live in darkness and they need light. When you go to school or in your social circles, they need light. And how you live. How and if you live out obedience and holiness before Christ will or will not point someone home. There are eternal consequences at stake as to whether you live in obedience to Christ. You, you track with what I'm saying? Eternal destiny is held by whether you point. A senior in high school had the opportunity to uh, become our school district and our public school district. Every fifth grader had the opportunity to go to camp. I mean, it was kind of really cool whether they could afford to donate and. And so fifth graders had the opportunity, the opportunity. This particular camp was located in a, a really remote part of our area so that in any distance, any sort of miles, you'd have a hard time coming into human contact as to where its location was. And, and as a result, um, we had the opportunity to, to go on a lot of hikes and, and wilderness sort of excursions and various things. Now, can you imagine today having a senior in high school uh, host 15 fifth graders in a cabin for a week? I mean, that's crazy. I, would, I wouldn't let my kids go to that. <laughs> but nonetheless, they, that's how it worked, and we, and we did. But notwithstanding, what was even worse than that was that they encouraged and urged us to take night hikes. Now, a night hike is when uh, after the sun has set and you finish supper and you've gone through the various camp meetings of the, of the, of the evening and everyone's getting ready to settle in for bed, you take your you take campers and you take them up a hill. Now, mind you, this is a... This is a, a steep, rocky hill with a lot of slippery gravel and, and broken up rock. And, and the shrubbery is, is very loose. It's a chaparral forest, which means that the roots don't go really deep and it's very surfacey kind of brush. And, and it's filled with danger all around. But our job was to take a bunch of fifth graders in the middle of the night and take them up a hill. Fortunately, most of them brought flashlights. But as you would imagine, most of them, within the first part of the week, began kept their flashlights on all night, so that only a few conservative ones, by the end of the week when the night hike took place, still had their lights going, still had a, a, a battery enough to keep those lights. So here I am with 15 or so fifth graders hiking up this steep, rocky cliff hill up to a place called Prayer Mount, and even though it was a public school district, I, I decided I was going to pray with them when we got to the Prayer Mount where they're using this facility. I was going to pray with them. And here we are, traversing up this winding path, getting on this slippery train, and only a few, to, few of them had the light. <laughs> and I want to tell you, those that had the light, they were the heroes. That's just the honest truth. I mean, they were, everyone was looking to those who had the light. Listen to me, believers. You are the light of the world. That's not me. That's you. So shine. Go out there and shine. In, in the midst of a world where everything is backwards or upside down, where you feel like everything's been flipped, and, and where where it's really hard to make uh, sure what, what's the right thing, you be in the Word. You live in such close communion and connection with Christ so that as you live out your life, you shine brightly in the world. Fast forward about 25 years later, I was asked to speak uh, at a church in Kentucky, uh, maybe it was about seven or eight years ago, actually. And um, in this location, just a few miles away, 
was one of the United States state parks. It was Mammoth Caves in Kentucky. It's one of the largest underground cave systems in the world, and I believe it is the largest in the continental United States. We went down in there with, with some of our friends and uh, along with the rest of the group that was assigned to us. We would begin to go down into the cave, down deep. I think Grace and Hannah and Caleb were, were with us at the time. Maybe Abby, much. I think so. And we went down into this cave, and the further and further we went, the darker and the darker it got. Until finally we were in what was the belly of the cave. And I want to tell you, it was dark even with all of the light that they had provided. It was dark. But then they flipped the lights out. It, like, you know, to have an effect. And there was a palpable sense as though all of the oxygen in the room rushed out. Not, not that the, the light provided any oxygen, of course, but there was a there was this innate sense or feel as, as though everything had been sucked out of the room. Pure and utter darkness. My, my eyes tried to adjust to the light. The children were like, Daddy, Daddy. Well, I, mean, I mean, it was a little freaky. I'll just be honest with you. And that was left on and for, for a little while. And when the lights were finally turned back in that deep, dark cave, there was an audible sigh and sense of relief. Like, oh. But because the light provided security and guidance and hope, you are the light of the world. Go let your light shine. So you may ask, you know, why does God give us all these commands? Why is he wanting us to obey? Why does he enforce such seemingly strong statements of what I should do? It's because you are to provide resemblance of the Father to the world. You are the only reflection of him in the world. You are the only one that can provide the truth of Christ in this world. Resemblance, bla innocence, blamelessness. This is why your obedience is not, God doesn't say, hey, I want you to do this or live like this or act this way or take this sort of attitude because he's trying to cramp your style. God's not like, I'm just going to make it really hard for you to live in this world, you know, maybe it'll work out for you. That's not it. It's because he's a loving God, and because he's loving, he has great plans for you, and he's seeking to use you to guide people back home. Let me ask you, if the sacrifice of the sin that you love so much, the sin that you cherish, that thing that you will hold on to and keep, if, if sacrificing that on the cross of Christ, which he's already done for you, by the way, but if yielding that up to God leads someone else home, forever home, in eternity home, where they come to see the beauty of Christ, where they come to see that his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave and, and the eternal gift of life that he offers is worth receiving because you live a life of such contrast to the way the rest of the world works. If you living that way points someone to hope, isn't it worth it? Isn't it worth it? That you would say, I'm going to sacrifice whatever pleasure or whatever desire I have that Christ might be made known, that people might see the Father through me, that I might resemble Christ in my attitude, in my actions, in my character, in my conduct, and even in my conversation. May these things be true of us as followers of Christ. Why? What's the goal of obedience? Blamelessness, innocence, and resemblance. May we be like those children of God. Let's call upon the Lord now. Father, I thank you for the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I recognize, Father, that these things are insurmountable. These challenges for us are beyond our ability, but not beyond yours. So create in us a clean heart, O oh God. Renew in us a steadfast spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we might become blameless and pure children of God without blemish in this twisted and crooked world among whom we shine as lights. May we shine as lights in this world, I pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. If you're a follower of Christ here today and there's sin in your life that needs to be repented of, I would encourage you right now in the quietness of these moments, whether you're at home, whether you're watching from somewhere, or whether you're here live right here in our presence, just to stop and say, oh God, you see it, you know it. I hardly need to vocally confess it to you because you already know but as an acknowledgement that your way is right and my way has been wrong, I verbally agree with you, God, and I turn from that. Give me the grace to give me the courage 
to make the right decisions to follow after you. God, change my heart now. I repent and I turn from my sin and I look to you. Let me shine as lights. Maybe there's someone on in your heart that uh, on your heart that that needs to know Christ. They they're living in this broken world and they're lost and they're still in darkness. You are the light of the world. Will you pray for them in these moments that you might shine as the light of Christ? Let's sing this final song as a song of praise and commitment to our Lord and bless his name in these moments. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the safe the Lord it is so sweet to trust in Jesus just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life at rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust. How I prove Him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust Him more Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus just to trust His cleansing love And in sin will fail to come Be the healing cleansing love Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him with all of our heart as we go. I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus Savior friend and I know that Thou art with me will be with me to National Hills, we love you. You guys have a great week. We will see you inside and on Facebook. Have a great week.